Before we get started talking about the visual system, uh, first a couple of reminders. The Fixing My Gaze homework is uh, due when you go to your discussion section. Everybody hopefully knows when their discussion section is. Uh, so um, five of you are tonight, and then the other ten of you are tomorrow morning. And then we're all going to be back together uh, at 9.40 tomorrow to discuss the book collectively as a group and also talk a little bit more about the visual system. Um, uh, and so if anybody doesn't know where they're supposed to be going either tonight or tomorrow, please let me know right away after class and I'll let you know where you're supposed to be. Um, also, at the end of class on your way out, you should pick up the quizzes from uh, Amanda and Megan. Um, they are due tomorrow morning at uh, 9.40 when class time starts together as a group. Um, but some of you have discussion section right before. So I'm um, in the time limit, it's still an hour. Uh, it's a little bit shorter than the last quiz in length, so it'll probably take a little bit less time. Um, and if you have questions about topics or anything um, about the material, uh, you can go ahead and send, send an email as you're doing like sort of last minute studying this afternoon or something. Um, okay, so what questions do people have either about that or about any of the material from the past unit that's going to be on the, the uh, quiz, language uh, material in general, um, language areas, anything like that? Yeah, sure. Um, when you choose your topics, do you need to have 45 articles? Or oh, yeah, for the, for, so for the report, ideally, you will. You can email me um, an article. Um, actually, uh, that, that reminds me. I'll uh, I'll um, uh, email out. Um, so actually, really, just um, if you go to um, scholar.google.com, uh, that's probably your best bet. Um, they they serve a variety of uh, different academic journals, um, and then you want a paper that has uh, a methods and a results section in it. And uh, it needs to be presenting new data and new experiments. Uh, you can email me, if you're not sure or having trouble finding a paper, then you can email me uh, tonight or something and let me know the general topic and I can also help you find papers. Um, the reason that this is due a week before the outline is because uh, typically about half of the people, maybe sometimes a little bit more, um, have trouble finding the right paper. And so over the next couple of days, um, I'll email back and forth to everybody about their papers and see um, if you find one that looks great, then I'll just say, okay, good, you're set. Um, if you find one that looks like it fits the requirements but may not have quite enough material for you to write a quality report with, then I'll let you know about that and we can try and find other options that will work um, and help you write a better report. And then if it's, um, a review article, then I'll just tell you, well, this is um, a fine reference to use. Um, and by the way, you're allowed to use as many additional references as you want, but it needs to focus on one paper, one original piece of paper. Um, and so, yeah, so, so, so you can get all of that uh, there. Um, and so anyway, I will, uh, so, so I'll say, okay, well, this is a fine additional reference, but you need to still find the focus point, and I will based on the review article, try and find an original research article that's sort of directed at the same topic. Um, but I'm happy to get emails where you're like, I can't find a paper, I want to do something about, um, you know, about smell, or I want to do something about, uh, about the mental representation of words in the brain, or whatever. Um, and I'm very happy to, to help you track those down. Um, in fact, uh, that ends up being, again, like I said, for more than half of the class, typically, that, that's, that's a big part of what goes on. Uh, and if and so you know as long as you send me something by tomorrow, you'll be fine. Other questions about any of the upcoming stuff or the last week material? Okay, so um, today we're going to be talking about the visual system, um, and uh, and. There's a lot, you could spend an entire semester or an entire lifetime studying the visual system. Um, there's a lot um, that we know and a lot to learn and a lot that we don't know and a lot um, to still discover. And we only have a couple class periods to talk about this, bless you. And, um, 
And so I want to focus in, um, we're going to skip past the um, many, many stages on the retina, which is at least um, uh, in, uh, one or two lectures in itself, just to get the basics of what goes on in the retina. We're going to skip past most of that and focus in on um, primary visual cortex. So primary visual cortex is back here. We'll talk about how information gets from the eyes, which sit here at the front of the head, back to primary visual cortex. But the main focus uh, for the next class period or two is going to be on primary visual cortex. And in particular, two different types of, um, two related types of plasticity or changes that happen in the primary visual cortex that um, relate very much to, uh, to Dr. Berry's experience that she describes in the Fixing My Gaze book. And so, uh, and so we're going to be talking about how experience, um, both early in life and as an adult, can rewire the visual cortex. Uh, in this class period, we'll focus mostly on early visual experience and the reorganization. Um, and this relates back to some of the ideas from, um, from Unit 2 when we talked about um, strengthening synaptic connections. Uh, we're not going, I, on this exam, I'm not going to um, ask you uh, about details of NMDA receptor and AMPA receptor activity or about um, the, where calcium ions are flowing, um, but one key idea that I do uh, hope that you remember from Unit 2 is the idea that when, um, when a presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron that are connected up are correlated in their activity, then that connection is going to get stronger, and when they become decorrelated, then the, then the connection between them will weaken. Um, and that is um, really fundamental to thinking about um, what goes on in the Fixing by Gaze book, and also, uh, and also the material that we're going to be talking about today, tomorrow, and a little bit uh, as well on um, Thursday and Friday. Um, and actually, even beyond that, when we get into the last unit of the course, we'll be returning to these ideas of reorganization of the, of the brain in response to experience. Um, but before we get into that, I do want to give a sort of general overview of a few things about the visual system. Uh, and one thing in particular about the visual system that is completely amazing to me and never ceases to amaze me um, is visual illusions. Um, so this is a visual illusion taken out of uh, your textbook. Um, and when I look at this, it looks to me like there's this spiral spiraling in. I just, that, that's what I see. That's, I cannot help but see that. But if you follow you have to sort of put your finger on it, but if you follow this circle all the way around, then it comes back right back to where you started. So it's not a spiral, it is a series of circles like a target. And I know that. I've, I, I, I've spent probably now collectively three hours of my life looking at this thing um, over the course of years teaching this, and I know that is the truth. And and I can't help but perceive it as a spiral. Um, and there are a lot of different reasons why that is, but um, the main feature is, the, one of the main issues with this illusion in particular is that your visual system lies to you in a lot of ways. Um, or it, it, it sort of, it's sort of like, well, uh, so when, when, when um, like when, when my kids are uh, are at home and they're they're you know uh, like, like one of my kids uh, walks over and uh, uh, oh so actually actually yeah so so, so on Saturday I'm off the floor in, in the in the kitchen and my five and I said that my five year old loves to run around the house it's like all he does all day and so I, I told my five year old I said okay the kitchen floor is wet do not run in the kitchen. Um, and so he, he, um, he uh, you know, sat still for a little while, and then about 20 minutes later, I, I was off doing something else, and I hear thud, and some crying, and I, and I went downstairs, and I asked him why I was running in the kitchen, and he said, well, because I, because, uh, I, it, it, uh, I, I checked, and the floor was dry, and it was time to run. And I know he didn't check, and the floor was dry, because the floor was still pretty wet, um, but he sort of made this story up, and I think he really believed it. Um, I don't think that he was lying so much as coming up with a plausible story that for him sort of was easier to conceptualize than, than, than what the truth really was. 
Um, and so that's kind of what your visual system does too, is it, is it has incomplete information and it fills in the spaces with its best guesses. Um, for this particular illusion, one of the big reasons that your visual system has incomplete information is that you have, um, uh, most of your visual system is actually really blurry. So uh, if you hold your thumb at about arm, arm's length, or maybe you make an okay sign at about arm's length, that's about all of the visual, um, that's about all of the, the visual space that you actually have any detail on. Um, and so if you're reading or anything else, just the fovea, just this part in the middle of your retina is the only part that has dense enough photoreceptors, um, as well as some other optical rearrangements that allow you to see with any degree of detail. And so in order to make sense of a picture like this, you need to sort of scan it with your eye, and then as you scan it with your eye, you look at a particular spot, and your brain fills in its best guess about the rest based on memory and based on what it's seeing, um, sort of like the current information that it has. And so any local spot in this picture, it's designed to look like it's spiraling inward because of the twist in the lines there. And so locally, it looks like a spiral. You can't see the whole picture all at once. You only see little local snippets. And the rest of it is sort of filled in as best you can by memory and, um, and the, the poor, blurry information that you have. Um, and even though it appears crisp, like my, my perception of this is that it's not blurry in parts and only one little sort of focus spot. My perception of that is that it's a nice in focus image. Um, but nonetheless, in fact, it is blurry in other places. And so my brain is taking the local image that it has good information about and the rest of it that it has sort of poor information and memory about and trying to construct a story about what's going on. And the story that the local image is telling me is that it's spiraling in. The, the best I have from memory and, um, and the blurry perception from the outside doesn't contradict any of that. Um, and, so, uh, and so the perception is that it's spiraling in. Um, and so, so that's kind of one aspect of it. And one other thing that's, that's equally incredibly bizarre to me about this is that like, I, can't, there's, I can't get my visual cortex to not see it. Like, I know that this is, this, this is different. And another example is this thing. Has anyone ever seen this one before? So, so those of you that have seen it before, you know that um, the, this square and this square are actually the same, the same um, uh, darkness. Um, and I know that too, but I, I still, I perceive that it is, that, that this square is lighter than this one. And there's a lot of reasons having to do with the fact that there's dark stuff surrounding this square that's surrounded by four darker squares. This one's surrounded by four lighter patches. Um, the, the, um, there is some sort of high-level cognitive awareness that can get down to my perceptual system because the idea that this is a physical cylinder sitting on a checkerboard and then it casts a shadow is all something that comes from higher visual system areas and goes back down to blur visual system. So, so I can, uh, there is some downward sort of backward flow of information toward the, toward the lower visual areas, but nonetheless, despite, again, my knowledge that that's the case, my perception can't break out of that. And so, and so there's, like, there's like this part of my brain, part of my sensory system, that is unable to adapt to what I know to be the case. Um, and so you can just kind of fade between them, or you can play with them in Photoshop. You can download the file and show you can play with them in Photoshop. Um, actually, it kind of creates a little bit of a weird illusion when you do the fade. I didn't realize that until I just started doing the animation fade. Because when you do the fade, um, the computer reprocesses the information a little bit. And so during the fade, the computer actually makes a quick transition as well. It's a little bit off. Um, but I encourage you to play around with this in Photoshop, download the picture, and convince yourself that I'm not lying to you about it. It's really kind of bizarre and hard to do. Um, so, so, you know, so your visual system is sort of making up stories based on the best of the can, but it's, um, but it's influenced by all of these things, including, so the title of this says Center Surround Receptive Fields, and that's something we'll talk about in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, but one of the things that your visual system does really well um, is adapt to changes in the overall, um, in the overall uh, illumination surrounding you. Um, and one example that's a little hard to demonstrate, but that's, um, but that's uh, sort of easy to, um, to describe at least is, um, so if I, uh, today, a day like today is kind of cloudy and this wouldn't quite be true, but on a nice bright sunny day, if I take 
um, I take this piece of paper and this backpack out, um, and I uh, measure how many photons are coming off of this backpack and how many photons are coming off of this piece of paper. Um, there'll be more coming off of this. That's, that's white and reflects more light than this thing. Um, then I bring them back inside and measure again how many photons come off this and how many photons come off the piece of paper. Um, and what I would just, again, there'd be more off the paper than the backpack. But if I compare the inside to outside, outside on a sunny day, this is reflecting way more light than this reflects inside on a sort of, in a sort of moderate, well lit room like this. Um, and yet, I perceive them as white and grayish, no matter where I take them. Um, and so that is um, because my, my brain knows that light levels can change, and I need to adjust for that. But that objects sort of retain a sort of constant property and constant percent of reflected light. And so I'm really just comparing the whole environment with the one object I'm looking on. And so if I see changes in light levels, then I'm going to in infer that it's, it's more important the difference between object A and object B than the absolute number of photons. So my eye doesn't count absolute number of photons. It looks for differences. Yeah, sure. So a few years ago at the World Science Festival, there was a presentation on what is color. Yeah. And, I went to, and one of the demos was they had a group of kids in like rainbow-colored shirts go on stage. Then they had everyone close their eyes, and they did something with the light. When you open your eyes, you couldn't tell the difference in the colors. How does that work? Whew, I don't know for sure. That's a real. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, whew, I, I would have to look at some of the details of it um, to see. Uh, so I mean, it, it would depend on you. Know, you can't. The, the, there's something that they have at the um, at the children's museum that my kids go to, um, and it's this really it's this like little wheel thing with um, gummy bears in it, and um, and there's like so there's some you know green gummy bears, and then there's um, all it's just it's like it's in case glass thingy with a bunch of random just they just threw a bunch of gummy bears randomly into it. Um, and there's, you know, like 10 different colors of gummy bears, but whatever. Um, and then as you turn the wheel, the light behind it changes. And um, as the light changes, um, when it gets to be the exact same color as the blue gummy bears, then the blue gummy bears and the white gummy bears become indistinguishable from each other um, because 100% of the light is being reflected because blue absorbs everything. Blue, blue, blue gummy bears absorb everything but blue and white, right? everything. Um, and, so, and so for a second it's like this sort of like flash where like all of a sudden they become indistinguishable from each other. Um, and then as you turn a little bit more and if it's the same color as the red gummy bears, then they sort of look like they flash and match with the white ones. Um, and so, um, yeah, and that's, that's because um, as long as there's um, a variety of wavelengths of light coming out at you, then you can distinguish colors and make a good guess. Um, but, in fact, you can um, sort of make mistaken perceptions as well um, if, if they have sort of too few wavelengths. So maybe they have, I don't know, just like, um, just like two wavelengths of light shining. I don't know. That's, that, yeah, I don't have a great question for it. Uh, or great answer that. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I hate it. Um, <laughs> you hate it? Yeah, I hate that I can't see the difference. Yeah. Um, but second of all, I'm wondering, is it because the, does it have anything to do with the speed of information processing the visual cortex versus the? No, not that. Some visual illusions do take advantage of that. Um, uh, yeah, I'd have to think for a little while to think about that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, so your auditory system processes information a lot more quickly. Um, you hear, you know, uh, sound, sounds that, that are um, 10 milliseconds apart or less, you can distinguish, but your visual system isn't that sort of like 50 milliseconds or something. Um, not that, not that, though. yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but I don't have to think. I'll just try to find some. There's some like vision, there's some like cross modal visual auditory illusions that, that take advantage of that. Um, actually, one that's not exactly that, but I'll try to remember to send out the link for the video of that is um, if you see somebody bouncing a basketball in a video and they're moving further and further away, 
uh, then as they're moving further and further away from the camera, there becomes a bigger and bigger sound delay. Um, but your brain still detects, up until a certain distance, your brain perceives the sound is coming at the same time as the visual information um, because your brain is sort of wired up to know that sound sometimes gets there a little late as things get further away. Um, if it gets far enough away, then you start noticing the difference, but it has to be like a half second almost before you start to notice the difference, um, which is pretty long time for perception. But that's a little different than the question you're asking, and I don't know off the top of my head. So, uh, okay, and so, so there's that, um, and then actually the, the, back to the question about color too. Um, so this is, um, so these are uh, two blocks that um, appear to be sort of the same pattern of blues and reds and greens. Um, the blues in the blue, the blue sort of uh, becomes indistinguishable from some of the, some of the light, uh, some, of the, some of the just sort of seems very dark. Um, but um, the, so in, uh, in yellow light, blue actually reflects, a blue, a blue object in, the, in pure yellow light will reflect very little color off of it because um, yellow and blue are sort of at opposite ends of the color spectrum. And so in yellow, if yellow is the only light coming in, then blue is gonna be absorbing almost all of the light coming in. Um, and then conversely, in blue light, the yellow pigment is gonna be absorbing almost all of the light that's coming in. Um, and so your visual system, what it does is not look for the absolute, um, uh, the absolute, um, uh, you know, blue number of blue photons coming off of this and number of red photons coming off of this, but just again compares one to the other and says, okay, well, this is a lot less yellow, which is equivalent to saying it's a lot more blue than what's around it. Um, this one here is a lot less blue, i.e. more yellow than what's around it. And so, um, and so then I perceive this, I perceive these as blue, and I perceive these as, as, these as yellow. That one's these, these as yellow. Um, but in fact, and again, you can sort of play with this on, uh, on Photoshop on your own, but in fact, this blue square and that yellow square are exactly the same shade of gray. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and your brain is just sort of collecting what's around it and comparing what's around it with what it sees and coming up with decisions about what goes on with that. Um, so yeah, but any questions about that? So we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, about the measurements in particular. Um, one other uh, one that's always a fun illusion uh, is um, these, uh, these cars are really the same size, they're just photoshopped together. Um, so here, um, you, and you're, you're sort of built to perceive, perce to, to, this relates to the Fixing My Gaze book, um, with, you're, you're built to think that things that are further away will appear smaller on your eye, and so you compensate for that by assuming that if it does appear the same size in your eye, that it must be really larger. And that's one of the monocular cues for depth that Dr. Barry talks about in Fixing My Gaze work, but really they're all three just the same photoshopped image. And so again, you're sort of relying on what's around to build a perception. Okay, and so for today, um, we're gonna mostly skip past the, the, the retina. Um, one thing that the retina does is it actually is where a lot of this, this surround um, comes in, and um, just to sort of give a very brief overview of that, um, there are cells in the retina that respond to, to light here, um, and then there'll be other cells that have receptive fields that are in space surrounding it that also respond to light, um, and others that respond to darkness, and so this, these cells will inhibit all of their neighbors. And so if there's light right here, only here, then this cell will become active. If there's light everywhere, then these cells, then this cell tries to get activated, but it gets shut down by all of its neighbors. And so what ends up happening is, um, is, a, is roughly the equivalent of nothing at all. Um, so no change in activity when there's constant illumination. Um, Actually, one other, since I can't resist talking about these, um, one other that I like is, what color are the words on this slide? 
black. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, they, they are really, by most reasonable definitions, black. <clears throat> they are black. Um, but in fact, so, so what color is the slide? What color is the, what color is the, the screen? Black. Not, not this part. This part. Black. Looks black? Okay, well, here, let's try. Let's try. Oops. Yeah, okay, we'll close the screen there. Yeah, yeah, white, right, yeah. Um, and so, the, in, in the middle of that, in the middle of the black parts of that O, or in the middle of that line, or in the middle of that dot, or whatever, it's as white as that. Um, and yet, because it is way the heck darker than everything around it, when I add a whole bunch more white light, your perception is that it's white. And so, um, and, and that's because your brain is not saying how many photons are coming off, or your eyes aren't saying how many photons are coming off. Your eye is saying, is this a little bit darker, a lot darker, or the same as everything around it? Um, and if it's a little bit darker, then it's perceived as gray. If it's a lot darker, then it's perceived as white. And if it's the same, then it's perceived as constant with whatever's surrounding it. Um, and, and then you just sort of like head out to the next edge, essentially. Um, and actually, if anyone does computer science, your brain essentially does what's equivalent to like JPEG compression on an image. Um, your eye does that actually, where it's just looking for edges. Yeah. Uh, speaking of color, there, the last bullet point is a different color. Oh yeah, that is yeah. That's a little. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that wasn't intentional. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I make because when I make my uh, my slides, the first overview slide I always list everything, and then the last one I. Uh, and then the next ones, I just sort of highlight what we're going to be talking about. And um, and there was a, I, I had, I would, as I went back and edited somehow, keynote approach, or I got a little confused about that. That's a, that wasn't intentional, although it does kind of illustrate the point a little bit. But, um, uh, I mean, this is actually brighter than this so called white screen, and yet it appears to be not white. But uh, okay, so anyway, we'll be talking, we'll just you know, skip past a lot of the details of how all of this and a lot of other processing you know, gets, gets accomplished, and instead talk about um, the path from your eye to your brain, um, and then move right into talking about binocular vision, um, and in particular, sort of the, where your eyes um, differentially project in the, um, in the uh, visual cortex. And, at, and in some stages of visual processing, information from your left and right eye are kept separate from one another. And then at other stages, they come together to create this 3D perception. And so we'll be talking about the stages where they're separate, as well as the stages where they come together. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk about uh, a little bit of an overview of what happens after primary visual cortex. Um, and so we'll talk about, uh, and this relates back to some of the stuff that I talked about about a week ago when I first introduced kind of the whole brain and different areas in the brain that have different types of processing that they do. Um, and then finally, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about visual development and plasticity, which uh, will relate to the Fixing My Gaze book. So, when you're, when you're seeing things out in the world, um, so, uh, you know, looking out at the room, right now, I'm look, it, everything is sort of in reference to me, and actually particularly in reference to where my eyes are pointing. So, as I move my eyes around, my visual world is always sort of in reference to that point that my eyes are fixated. Um, and so that is how we define the visual space. Um, it is uh, sort of, it is essentially the definition of egocentricity, where it is, it is all based on me as the subject and where I am, and where I am pointing my eyes physically. That's, that's kind of a critical uh, determinant of, of what counts as left and right. Um, and so there's some point out there, like right now it's the, like the door handle right there. That's the point that I'm pointing my eyes at. Um, and so from there, Everything that is sort of draw an imaginary vertical line um, right between my eyes. I, I turn like this and the line goes like that, but whatever. Um, so you draw a vertical line like that. And then everything to the left of that vertical line is called my left visual field. And everything to the right of that vertical line is my right visual field. <clears throat> and eventually, everything in my right visual field will end up in the left hemisphere of my brain, everything in my left visual field will end up in the right hemisphere of my brain. 
Um, the two hemispheres communicate with each other, and there are fun things that you can look up about the split, split brain patients, where sometimes for epilepsy people, um, uh, surgeons will cut the connection between the two hemispheres, and then you have some kind of bizarre, funky um, consequences of that that we probably don't really have time to go into. Um, okay, so so that's that's sort of the the, the visual world, left and left and right visual world. Um, so if I if I close one eye, then uh, then Laura kind of gets lost over there a little bit. I don't quite see her, but everybody else is at least still sort of in my field of perception. And if I close my right eye, then my computer is sort of falls out of my field of perception, but everything else is sort of still there. So most of the visual world from about here to here is goes into both of my eyes. Uh, and so there needs to be a sorting process where just for my right eye, everything to the left of this area that gets into my right eye needs to get to my right cortex. And everything to the left of that imaginary line that gets to my right eye needs to go to my left cortex. So in other words, um, about half of the stuff going into my right eye is going to end up in my um, left visual cortex, slightly more because the computer is going to go to my left visual cortex and that's something only my right eye can see. And about half, a little less than half of my visual world that my right eye sees goes to my left cortex. So it's not the right eye goes to left and left eye goes to right, it's about the visual world from, from sort of the re um, reference to where my eyes are visible at a particular space. Um, any questions about that? So, um, and there's actually one exception to that that we're going to mostly kind of ignore because um, it just complicates things. But it turns out that the fovea, that sort of magic circle in the middle of your visual field where you have good perception, ends up getting redundantly processed. It gets, everything in the fovea goes to both hemispheres. So that's kind of the one exception to that. Um, and, uh, but aside from the phobia, everything on the left world goes to the right side of my brain. Everything on the right world goes to the left side of my brain. Um, and as you all learned from fixing my gaze, one of the big advantages that two eyes give you, um, assuming that they align properly and that your visual cortex is able to bring the images together, is that it gives you a three-dimensional sense of the world, um, and that is exactly what three-dimensional movies um, take advantage of. They use typically polarized light um, to, uh, to um, deliver different images to the two retinas that are slightly different from each other, and those slight differences um, mimic the differences that you get between um, left and right eye uh, perceptions of something as you walk around the world. So for example, something close like this, um, if I close, if I look just at my left eye, then this thing is covering up Amanda right now, and then I look out the right eye, and this thing is covering up uh, Jimmy right now. Or sorry, left. so so it sort of jumps back and forth. Um, and, and in the fix of my gaze book, she talks a lot about how if I move my head, nearby objects move a lot faster than far away objects, um, and that is very is sort of related to the idea of two different cameras from two different angles will collectively give you a little bit of information about depth. Um, okay, what questions do people have about any of that? Okay, so, so how this is accomplished then is um, things in the left visual field, because of because light tends to travel pretty much in straight lines, it gets a little bit thin by the lens, um, but things in the left visual field will land on the um, right side of my right retina and the right side of my left retina. Um, I'm not going to explicitly test you on these terms, but you'll see them sometimes. The temple, these are my temples, um, and then my nose, um, and so uh, the temporal parts of the retina are the ones that are out toward the sides, and the nasal parts of the retina are the ones that are close to the nose, and so the left visual field will hit the temporal part of my right retina and the nasal part of my left retina, um, but it's easier for me to just remember that the left visual field hits the right side of both eyes, conversely the right visual field hits the left side of both eyes. Um, and then coming out of each eye is a bundle of about um, uh, 20 to 50,000 axons um, that uh, is called the optic nerve. Um, it meets 
the two optic nerves meet at a point um, under, sort of like right uh, underneath the middle of your brain called the optic chiasm, and then there is where sorting and organization happens. So the axons from the left side of my left eye and the left side of my right, uh, sorry, the left side of my left eye and the left side of my right eye will all go to the left side of my brain. The axons from the right side of my left eye and the right side of my right eye will all go to the right side of my brain. Um, and so the, 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 the left and right flip-flop happens because of sort of the optics and not the axon sorting, essentially. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so that's, that's sort of the overview there. Um, what questions do people have about any of that? Yeah, sure. It seems kind of inefficient to me. Yeah, the whole left-right switch thing is kind of inefficient. Um, you save about, I don't know, maybe a millimeter of axon per axon to do it this way, but then so many other axons in your body have to be a little bit longer to make things switch. And I don't know. Yeah, this would, there, there are 10 at least theories out there about why things are switched, um, and none of them have ever been terribly satisfactory to me, and the fact that there are 10 theories tells you that there's no consensus about what the heck is going on and why that happens. Uh, but it happens um, in uh, in all vertebrates and a lot of in a lot of invertebrates as well. Um, oh, what the heck was that? <laughs> huh. Okay. Uh, anyway, okay. So, um, so that's that's this. Um, so, let's. Uh, um, let's take about three minutes here while I collect my laser pointer. And, um, and uh, so think about if um, if you were if if somebody were to come along and cut, or you had some sort of uh, you know damage, maybe a, maybe a growth or, or something that happened that cut the optic nerve coming out of the left eye. What would you lose if you had something that um, that cut, say, the left optic tract? Then what would then what sort of visual information would you lose? So, so uh, just kind of think about the, the similarities and differences between um, cutting the left side here versus cutting the left side here, and what that would cause in terms of what you would lose. And let's just say take three minutes, kind of jot down some notes on a piece of paper about that, and we'll come back to you. Saturday night, like, I fell asleep, so I just, it was like 12 o'clock in the morning, 
Some other types of differences um, between the between um, if you have uh, sort of this this um, spreading out of axons that happens after the thalamus, which is what we're going to talk about next, um, and, and so you can actually use orders of your visual field as well. Um, and then because of the representation of the phobia being being like it is, um, the, there's uh, sometimes the phobia is sort of spared in both sides. Um, okay, and so um, and so. If you think back to about a week ago when I talked about the thalamus, and um, so the the critical area in the visual system to know about in the thalamus is the so-called LGN or lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, for those of you that are taking biology classes, nucleus to you might be in the middle of a cell um, in neuroscience. Nucleus actually means a whole bunch of neurons that all live together inside the brain or spinal cord. Um, and so it's not the middle of one cell, it's a whole bunch of neurons all living together. Um, and so lateral just means it's a little bit more off toward the side than the medial genicular nucleus, which is what we'll be talking about the auditory system on Wednesday. Um, and uh, geniculate actually uh, refers to, it's kind of knee-shaped, and it's Latin for knee. Um, and so, just like we talked about before um, with the thalamus in general, in particular, visual information, all the visual information that's coming into your brain is coming into this lateral geniculate nucleus. And then that connects up with the visual cortex, and, um, and collectively, they build a representation of what's out there. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to tell you something about the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then I want you to forget it. Um, because it gets super confusing in a little bit. So there's one thing to remember and one thing to forget. Um, one thing to remember about the lateral geniculate nucleus is that, for example, here, 
Um, the, the, so the right temporal retina and the left nasal retina are both seeing the right visual world. And they're both going to end up in the right lateral genicular nucleus. So that's thing one. So right LGN um, uh, gets, um, gets left visual world from both eyes. Each cell in the LGN only gets um, one eye or the other. So you pick any cell in the lateral genicular nucleus, it's either going to respond to the right eye or the left eye. Um, and then, uh, and so those are two things to remember about it. Um, the thing to forget is that these cells are separated into layers. So there happen to be, unfortunately enough, because as we'll see in a minute, um, there's six layers somewhere else, um, but there happen to be six layers in the lateral genicular nucleus. Um, and those six layers each get either input from one eye or the other, and I never remember. Um, and there's also some sub, some sub processing, some divisions of those layers. Um, but, but that is the thing to forget because we're going to talk about layers that I actually care about and that you need to be thinking about when we get to the visual system. So the, the sort of the, the core points here in the thalamus is that the cells are what we call monocular. So each cell is only aware of one eye or the other. Um, so each cell is monocular, um, and, um, and this is where we've got um, the, the, the sort of right visual world versus left visual world distinctions uh, is, is uh, starting to get made, but only at the level of the whole structure. No individual cell is aware of the two, uh, of the two eyes' different perspectives on the visual world. Yeah, sure. Within each LGN, are the cells evenly distributed for which ones receive input from the Um, no, uh, not quite. Um, and that has to do with, again, the fact that my left, my right eye sees a little bit more of the right visual world, so a little bit more of my, so there are a few, a little bit more cells in my left LGN that are going to be getting input from my right eye. And if you add up cells from my, from my right LGN, a little bit more of them get input from my left eye. Uh, and actually, this is... This sort of organization is pretty similar among humans and dogs and cats and, um, and pr most primates. And, um, uh, and you generally find, although not always, with humans it may be more related to tool use, but, um, but, uh, uh, but with a lot of with animals that hunt for a living that are carnivorous, you generally see eyes pointing forward and almost equal representation in the two thalamus of the two eyes. In an animal that gets eaten for a living or for, you know, tries to avoid getting eaten as part of its daily life, um, you tend to see the eyes out to the side more. And so almost all of, like for a bunny rabbit or a rat or something, almost all of its right eye's axons are going to go to its left thalamus and almost all of its left eye's axons are going to go to its right thalamus. Um, and there's only a very narrow field in which they're, they're able to see three dimensions. Um, and so the, the, um, the left and right thalamus, um, uh, are, 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 and, and, and I mean, the, the advantage of that is that you get to see more of the world, right? They can see almost completely around 360 degrees. Um, the disadvantage of that is you don't get as good of depth perception. Um, but if I'm running away from, uh, from a lion that's coming after me, um, then I don't care so much how far away it is. I want to know what direction it is so I can go the other one. And it doesn't really matter if it's 10 feet or 30 feet away, I'm still going to do the same thing. Whereas if I'm, if I'm leaping onto and killing a bunny rabbit or whatever, um, then I need to know how far away it is so I can leap on it and catch it and don't fall short or overleap or whatever. So, yeah. So if, they have, if animals that tend to be more prey have the eyes on their side of the head and don't really have 3D, horses have their eyes on the side of the head, how do they see jumps and depth? Um, so, yeah. Um, Part of it is like so. So, with enough training, you can do three dimensional. I mean, like Susan Berry was able to navigate a three dimensional world, and 
there are plenty of monocular cues. Um, you know, if you put a patch over my eye, um, I would not be bumping into things. I sort of have a sense of how big things are. Um, I, um, as you're moving, you're getting a lot of cues just for motion because your eye, your, your, even one eye, is physically in different places at different times, and depending on how far away the object is, that is going to um, change the way it moves around in your visual field and relative to other objects. And so with monocular cues, you can do that. Um, also, there is, a, there is a narrow binocular field um, that all these animals have, and so for things that are straight in front of them, they do still have depth perception. Um, it's just not that, it's just that for most of their visual field, that's not the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it takes work to, to figure that out. Um, yeah. Other questions about that? Okay, and so um, here's a general picture that you've taken out of your book, um, looking at a person and where the things in the visual field are represented in the brain. Uh, and so you just kind of get a sense of, of where uh, some of these faces. There's also distortions because there's a massive overrepresentation of phobia and things in the periphery are underrepresented, kind of like that homunculus that we looked at, that guy with the big hands, um, and that your somatic sensory system um, pays more attention to hands and face than the rest of your body. Your visual system pays a lot more attention to the phobia than the rest of your visual world. And if you want to see something, your eyes move around a lot to, to collect information about it. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me see. Okay. Leave this up. Oops. Get a, get a, give myself a little bit of work here. <clears throat> okay, so um, right eye, left visual field, um, and left eye left visual field, both project separately to the LGN, where again, the cells are all monocular. Um, and since this is the, the left visual field, this is going to be the right LGN. This is projecting too. And keeping your lefts and rights straight is something that like half of the class usually gets turned around at some point when they're describing information flow in the visual system. Um, so I, I really encourage you to spend a lot of time thinking about left and right and, and left vision. And it also gets confusing because um, people, there's so many acronyms. So like left visual field, LGN, um, and LGN starts with an L, but some people sometimes get turned around and think that that means it must always be left, which it isn't. So anyway, just kind of be attentive to that. Um, okay, so, so we've got then, um, again, coming out from the LGN, essentially two separate streams of pathway. Um, we've got the, um, the right eye, left visual field, and then the left eye, uh, left visual field. Um, the right visual field, meanwhile, is going to the left LGN, and the exact same thing is happening, it's just reversed. There. So, um, so I'm only going to draw one side, um, but the exact same thing goes to the other LGN. Um, and so our left visual field is getting to our right LGN. The mirror image is happening on the other side, but we're just going to Actually, I am going to get rid of this for a second and we'll bring that. Okay. <clears throat> and so these axons go out to primary visual cortex, also known as V1. And these axons are going to make synaptic connections. So cortex as this, oops, this guy here illustrates, um, has six layers. It's unfortunate that it happens to be the same number of layers as the LGN, which is why I told you to forget about the LGN, because we don't care about the numbers of the layers there, but we do in cortex. And so cortex, here's sort of a chunk of cortex. Then we can divide it up into six layers, and this was done by some early anatomists, that uh, actually one in particular, one in early anatomist in particular, that decided that there were six layers of cortex. 
Um, and probably if we were if we could go back in time and do it all over again, we would tell him, no, don't use don't use six layers because really functionally there's sort of only four. But we stick with his numbering because it was the first. So up at the top is layer one. Um, above this is your skull. So this is like right on the surface of the cortex here. Up at the top is layer one. Layer one is a place where you find a lot of synapses and almost no neurons. So we kind of don't even care about layer one because layer one is, um, is not um, where we're going to find any neurons that we're never interested in. Below that is a chunk that this early anatomist guy, named Santiago Ramon y Cajal, um, decided were two distinct layers. And a lot of people think he was right, and other people think he was sort of should have lumped them together. Um, but we're going to lump them together and call them layer two and slash three as one sort of um, uh, um, lump together group. And below that is layer four. And then below that, we have layer five and layer six. Um, OK, and so as I drew them here, the inputs from the right LGN are going to our right primary visual cortex. And they will make synaptic inputs in layer four. So layer four is the input from the alumnus. And here in layer four, there's also a sharp distinction between right eye inputs and left eye inputs. So if you look in layer four and record activity of neurons, some of them will respond to the left, some of them respond to the right, very few respond, that's, we're going to say none. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but we're just going to say none. None respond to both eyes. So these cells still, individual cells, are monocular here. Okay, so what questions do people have about what's gone on so far with that? We're going to get to it. Yeah, it doesn't, they, things don't go in order because biology is a disaster sometimes, but yeah, things don't go Other questions? We're going to get to the other layers in a second. Okay, now from, okay, so from layer four, the neurons here send their axons up into layer two, three, and they kind of all co-mingle here like this. And so here, there's, they're, they're, now here in layer two, three, there are fuzzy borders set. There's sort of a fuzzy border. Um, but this is going to be our, layer two is going to be our main processing stage. And um, our cells here are going to be mostly binocular and then a few that are still monocular. So this is our magic spot where, for the first time, information from the left eye and information from the right eye are meeting up in the same neuron. So we have you know, a neuron here, a neuron here. These neurons are the first neurons that see simultaneously, what the, get, get information simultaneously about what the left eye is seeing and what the right eye is seeing. Um, and so this is going to be the magic spot where depth perception begins to be. Any questions about that? We'll come back and talk a little bit more about depth perception in a few minutes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so but that's, that's like the magic spot, especially since we're talking about depth perception. Too. Okay, and so then from here, and then there are some cells over here, some cells over here, and then collectively, Our layer two, three cells are going to project down to layer five and layer six. Um, and layer five is kind of the main output to the um, rest of the brain. 
And layer six actually sends it output sort of feedback to the phallus. So remember I said before when we first introduced the thalamus that its job is to figure out what goes in, but it also is kind of having ongoing conversations essentially with your cortex about um, what is being perceived or what is being thought of or what is being decided depending on the area of the cortex. The thalamus is helping it do whatever its job happens. Here we're trying to do perception, and so the thalamus is helping to, um, to build coherent perceptions um, and help the cortex also to update those perceptions with new information that comes in from the outside world. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more um, probably, next, uh, yeah, probably next class period about what happens in terms of the, the rest of the brain in layer five outputs um, and what that all means. Any questions about that though at this point? Yeah, sure. Um, so, like, what happens in layer one? Like, oh, yeah. Well, so layer one is some of the axons. So, some of the dendrites of the layer five cells actually extend up to layer one, and some of the axons from layer two, three go meet them there. Um, and that drawing, drawing the dendrites on. I just want to draw the axons just because it gets complicated. But yeah, um, but that that's actually the spot where some of those synaptic contacts are made. Um, but if you completely forget about layer one, that's fine. Um, we're, the, the layer one, I think, is never, yeah, layer one is not going to be the answer to anything on that question. Um, it's, uh, if you get into like the mechanics of cortical processing and, and um, the, the locations of signals, that's important, but yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, now, you talked about Ramon Cajal earlier. Yeah. Uh, so, how did he split up layer two, three? Um, there are, um, the cells in layer two are physically smaller. And there is some sort, and um, uh, and they also have slightly different populations of um, inhibitory neurons that live in them. Uh, and there actually, there's a faculty member here at CMU that is um, one of the big proponents of um, sort of like we shouldn't lump them together. And they're really sort of they're distinct, and they're doing distinct kinds of processing. But for a first sort of pass at understanding processing, then we're just going to. There's enough to keep track of this. Yeah. 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 Any other questions about that? Okay, so we'll bring back our picture. Um, okay, so, so these are the cortical layers um, taken out of actually slightly different types of fingers, but the same, but very similar images appear in yours. Um, and here also two layers sort of lumped together. Um, this is your visual cortex, and in your visual cortex, it's sometimes called striate cortex, and you'll see that once or twice, um, because there's a dark band in layer four, because all of those thalamic inputs, all of those axons coming in together, actually make it appear physically darker. Um, and that's one of the key features that allows you, uh, that allows neurobiologists to look at a section of cortex and say right away, oh, that's visual cortex, because you just see that dark band, and that's one of the few places in the thing where you see that. Um, okay, and so, kind of going to skip past this a little bit, but your book describes it. Um, if you inject certain radioactive dyes into an eyeball of an animal, then the axons that go to the thalamus will collect those radioactive dyes and pass them on to the thalamic neurons, the neurons that live in thalamus, which then go out to the cortex. And so if you look, um, so backing up a little bit to what I had here, um, there's these sort of left eye and right eye distinct zones in the visual cortex. And if you look across the whole visual cortex, um, side on like this, then you see left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, sort of alternating patches between the eyes. Um, so I only drew two neighboring regions, but there's you know, another right eye patch over here, then left eye, and right eye, and on and on and on. That's sort of the side on view, which is what, oops, what this here is showing. 
Um, if you peel off layer two and three so you can get a top-down view, then it gets this sort of zebra stripe or fingerprint or something sort of pattern where you have stripes of left eye and stripes of right eye and stripes of left eye and stripes, stripes of right eye. Um, and so this is um, another view that I just I think grabbed off of Google Images. Now this is a top-down view of the visual cortex, um, where the eye that was injected with the radioactive dyes um, appears white when we put it on the photographic film, um, and then the parts of the brain that got input from the eye that we didn't inject appear dark. Okay. Um, and so... Here is kind of a view similar to what I just put, put up there, showing the monocular nature of all the cells in the, layer in the thalamus. Um, again, ignore the fact that there are six layers there. But then over here in the cortex, the, monoc the monocular nature of layer four cells and the sharp boundaries between them, and then the fuzzy boundaries that you see up in layer two, three, and down in layers five and six. Questions about that? Um, and so, like I mentioned before, you build perceptions about three dimension by comparing the two eyes. And the book goes into a lot more detail about this. But for example, if something's close, then it's going to project more laterally on your eyes. If something's far away, then things are going to project more medially on your eyes. Um, and, the, uh, and the book, the, the Fixing My Gaze book, goes into a lot of detail about that. Questions about that? So, um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to skip past the higher visual areas for now. We'll return to those uh, either tomorrow or later on this week. Um, and I want to instead move ahead and talk about development and plasticity, meaning reorganization of the visual field, visual system. So um, early on in visual development, again, we've got sort of right eye in the, LG, in the right LGN, and then left eye in the right LGN. And early on in visual, in visual development, these connections aren't so precise over here into layer four of primary visual cortex. Um, again, the people you can use V, visual field, vis visual cortex, you know, just yeah, work to make sure you get your acronym straight. Um, layer versus lateral, it gets confusing. Just, uh, so nonetheless, there's sort of, early on, there's a sort of dispersed projection going on into visual cortex, and then some of the stronger connections end up firing, um, the, the connections from the right eye going to, uh, going to one area here, so the connections into the right eye into this chunk of layer four are going to be really coherent with each other and pretty strong to start with. The connections over here um, from the right eye are going to be sort of disorganized and not as strong. And um, like we talked about with long-term potentiation, if you're already strong, then you're going to drive the synapse, to, they're going to drive the postsynaptic cells to fire, and then you're going to get even stronger. Um, and the ones that start out a little bit weak typically get weaker and weaker until, they, um, until the axons just um, degrade away entirely. Um, so early on in development, um, there's this sort of diffuse projection that then gets narrowed down into these zebra stripe patterns of left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, with clear boundaries between them and their form. <clears throat> but you can mess around with an animal's eyes early in development. So if you take a cat that is a month old, and for just a couple of days, cover up one of its eyes, then um, uncover that eye, and then right away or months later as the cat grows up, that eye that you closed for that three days to a week sort of time frame is going to have virtually no representation in the visual cortex. Um, the animal is essentially blind in that eye for life, because you have covered that eye up during this critical window in development where these separations between eyes are being formed. And um, since there's not really any activity coming in on that one eye, 
then, um, then you don't get any strengthening of synaptic connections. And so that eye that would have connected up with that area of visual cortex, instead its axons um, seem to sort of degrade away, or at least lose their functional, um, lose their ability to functionally drive the cortex. And so if you inject radioactive dye in the eye that you left open during that critical window, um, instead of having half of the cortex responding to that eye, virtually all of it responds to that eye. Um, and if you injected it into the eye that you close, there would be virtually none of the cortex that's getting it in that eye that you close. And so this is called the so-called critical period. This is one of, the, um, uh, one of the ideas that's been around in neuroscience since the, the late 60s, um, and, and really drives sort of thinking about brain plasticity. If you do the same thing in an adult and close its eye for even a month or six months and reopen it, the adult is still able to see out of that eye and there's still a pretty even representation in the visual cortex of the two eyes. So that's why we call this sort of a critical time window. If you manipulate the sensory experience the animal's getting during this sort of critical time window, then you get a dramatic reorganization of the brain. Uh, and the way the inputs go into the brain. If you leave that alone that during the critical time period and manipulate experience outside of that critical time period, then you seem to get uh, no reorganization. Yeah, sure. So where's the idea of come from slash, is it true that if an adult is put in a completely dark room for some period of time, they'll go blind? Is that? I've never heard of that. There was something when I was like in a cave that they told us like someone went blind after being I don't know. I mean, so, so, I mean, so, as we learned, oh, okay. like, as we learned with fixing my gaze, there's, um, this is kind of an oversimplification, right? So, yeah, so this is sort of a, sort of a, um, in fact, your brain does reorganize as an adult, and that's what we're going to be talking about next class period and after that. Um, so, I mean, I, I know if you take a young animal and deprive it of all visual experience early enough, then you will get that sort of phenomenal, um, and presumably, um, it just, so, so really, in adults, it takes longer to get reorganization, and it takes a little bit more work to get reorganization, but it can happen. Yeah. Um, it's kind of thorough, but I'm wondering, what, what animals' eyes do they look like? What kind this of is cats first, um, but it's been done a little bit in, actually, mouse, not so much, because, um, but, but one that's, um, that, that um, ferrets are another um, sort of smaller organism that people will look at, because, again, they have eyes facing forward. Um, sometimes in monkeys, but very rarely do we do these kinds of experiments in monkeys because it's a lot. Uh, it's 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 a small amount of data to, to get off of um, off of a monkey. Um, and you don't want to go through a lot of monkeys and experiments. People are actually moving more and more toward ferrets and even trying to find ways in, like squirrels or something to do these things. Um, okay, and so we're going to kind of skip past the technical details of that. Um, and so essentially, if you um, Look at, actually I'm just going to sort of skip ahead to this one. Um, so if you look at um, a normal adult brain, um, shining, you can shine light in one eye or the other and see a response. If you see only a response in, in this, if you, you, and you look at a particular neuron. And so if this neuron only responds to light in the left eye, then you give it a score of 1. If it only responds to light in the right eye, you give it a score of 7. If it's equally responsive, you give it a score of 4. And if it's somewhere in between, then you give it one of these intermediate numbers. If you have early monocular deprivation in an early in an animal's life, <coughs> thanks, then um, most of the cells only respond to the eye that is um, that was open during that time, even when after you've reopened the eye. You just, for two days, two and a half days, leave that eye closed. And now the, the eye that you closed for two and a half days, this brain doesn't respond to, only to the other one. Um, if you do that in an adult for a month, um, they are actually, they just had fewer cells, and so I wish they'd scaled this histogram up. I don't know why they didn't, um, but proportionally, it's exactly the same as before. Um, and it's not even that there are fewer, it's not that there are fewer cells that respond, it's just that they only exper experimentally collected data from a smaller number of cells here versus here. So, yeah. Um, and then sort of um, uh, the, the, the big point that I wanted to get to, be sure to get to about this, um, relates to the Fixing My Gaze book, which is if you take an animal and you um, surgically alter one of the muscles, um, so like, like Dr. Berry talked about in her book, um, when she was young, they did a little surgery to, to replace one of the muscles on her eyes that made it realign with her other. 
Um, and that ended up being more cosmetic than functional because she didn't have the optometry training um, that she needed to, 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 get a, to get a functional early in life. Um, but if, um, uh, but if you, you can also do sort of the reverse to an animal where you surgically alter the muscles um, early in life such that the eyes misalign and the animal can't get the two eyes to point to the same spot. Um, and, when, and when you do that to an animal, then what happens is instead of in layer two, three, most of the cells being pretty binocular and a few that are more monocular or entirely monocular, instead in layer two, three, you get very few cells that have any binocular response. Um, and mostly, um, uh, and, and mostly um, cells that respond to either one eye or the other, but never to both simultaneously. Um, and so this sort of connects up with the idea of being unable to fuse an image into a coherent picture because no cells are simultaneously responsive to both eyes. Um, and it also relates back to this idea where um, if your two eyes are looking at the same thing, then there will be some correlation between what they're seeing, and that allows your layer two, three cells to get combined input that strengthens from both um, eyes. But if the two eyes never see the same object, then there's never, oh goodness, there's never that correlation, and so, um, and so you lose that ability to make that, um, to make that fuse sort of cohesive. So, so what questions do people have about that? Yeah, sure. I think I'm just getting a little, I don't know. So um, what we're talking about is the loss of binocular vision. But right. So. Well, there's two, yeah, there's two things. Like, so there's, there's experiments where you, where you shut off one eye, right. and that's not really about binocular vision. Is that about? That's just, that's just demonstrating that experience in general, in this case sort of a sledgehammer experience change, will cause, will cause a reorganization. Okay. In a more general sense. And so in the cases where one eye is closed during the critical period, is that causing blindness? Um, yeah, I mean, it causes the brain to no longer be responsive to okay. makes you functional blind. Yeah, and that's, that's actually a really important distinction. Another thing that people often get confused about is that um, when we're talking about monocular deprivation covering one eye or the other, that is a totally different experiment from getting the two eyes to point to different spots. Um, it's useful as a way to think about it because it's the data that, it's, it's the type of experiment that's easier to do and where a lot of our thoughts about critical periods come from. But the misalignment of the eyes is a very different thing. And they're both eyes work, they just don't come up. And then the monocular experiments. So a couple more minutes left in class. Is that like a, is that blindness like an on or off, or is there a any sort of um, spectrum of that? If you do sh six to ten hours of deprivation, you'll get a little bit of like you'll get weakening, but not total loss. Mm -hmm. But after a day or two, it's pretty much total loss. Okay, I guess. To me, it's hard to conceptualize what like a spectrum of loss looks like, like in your vision. Um, well, it's sort of uh, you know, yeah. I don't know. I don't think one eye is necessarily blurrier than the other. Um, it's. I mean, so so, the best I can think of is there's there's a woman that she that, that Dr. Barry met with in college, a college student Dr. Barry met with who who said that. Um, if she didn't switch between eyes like Dr. Berry does, where you sort of act completely can't see. She said she can always see, she's always seeing double, um, but one eye she just knows is sort of the one that she should pay attention to. One, the, the thing on the left is the real image, the thing on the right is the phantom image, and she's just sort of learned that. Um, and so it's sort of, I think it's sort of like that, where um, if you've covered an eye for a little while and then brought it back, so you've had some loss but not complete loss, it's like one eye's just a little bit stronger. It's not necessarily clearer, it's just more important to what you're seeing. And actually, even for even for a typical person, one eye will be, when, when you're seeing, when you're cross-eyed or seeing double, you sort of pay attention to one eye rather than the other. And for people, for most people, it's sort of the same eye. And so, and so that's kind of what it is. It's like it's like your your one input is just one that your your brain is decided is more important. Okay. Yeah. So, and then it's separate from 
clearness of vision because that has more right. to do with your lens, right? Right, okay. yeah, the lens and the focusing. Yeah, we can talk about this more after um, after the, the, the fixing ideas discussions tomorrow. So again, most of you have discussion early. Uh, sorry, at nine or eight eight fifty five tomorrow. Some of you tonight. The quiz. Um, pick that up on your way out, and then that's going to be doing nine forty tomorrow. Morning.